So what it seems to me is that now we have a good understanding of this and, and its and its various functions, but it seems to me that B's definition says if I take a part away and it no longer has the same function, aha, it's irreducibly complex. Yes, and then, and, and, and then the point is, it's very, and the more systems like that you find, the more improbable it is that you, because now you have to account for an indirect pathway for each and every one of these systems. And I mean, B, and B, he argues uh, that there's hundreds of these systems out there, and, and now for, and now essentially, for every one of these systems that you have to uh, explain with an indirect pathway, I mean, you, you have to first account for the fact that some at some point in time, all the parts are together, then they were synchronized the right way, in the same place, at the same time. And no, just, no, you don't have to. No, yeah. you don't have to. And that's, that's the response that real evolutionary biologists have been, have been putting out for years. You don't have to have them all in place, all at the same time, all synchronized. Some of them can have different functions for long periods of time. Some of them can have no function. Evolution doesn't just select for something, it selects against things. And as long as something is relatively innocuous, like for example, uh, my earlobe doesn't really have any, any good function. Uh, but, and who knows, maybe a million years down the line, my ear, earlobe will, you know, evolve into something, or the human earlobe, not mine, I'll be dead, uh, will evolve into something that some future uh, intelligence will claim is irreducibly complex. It is, as I said at the outset, an argument from ignorance. It is, as I said a moment ago, a definition that is defining intelligent design into existence. There's no reason to accept be his definition of irreducible complexity as useful or valid in any sense. Sorry. It's, well, the reason why I'm saying it's useful is because now, it, it, because before you found out that the system was irreducibly complex, you could have said that it could have just evolved in a very direct way, step by step by step. No, now, no, you, you couldn't have. You, no, you have to uh -uh. no. Pathway because Gary, you know, Gary, this is where you. No. Keep, this is where you keep getting things wrong, Gary. You keep talking about. Well, you can just make this leap, or you could just said this, or you could have just uh, decided this. Or this isn't how we determine things in science. You look at evidence. You look at lineages. You look at uh, you, what. You look at the actual data that's out there. It's not a matter of well, you could just say this, or you could just say that, and so why not just say the thing that makes the most sense? I mean, which seems to be the whole idea that you're trying to sell us here. You just said that without irreducible complexity, you could claim that it came by direct, uh, direct evolution. No, that's well, not it. No, first. that's that's not it. it. You are making the implication that that irreducible complexity is not only a valid hypothesis, but it's that it's necessary in order for us to determine the actual process. And the answer to that is, you're freaking wrong. Because science is going to explain that, or not explain it, based on the evidence and going where the evidence leads. You don't need, evol you don't need irreducible complexity as a stopgap that, or as a, as a bridge that leads somewhere, because as I mentioned before, where it's leading you is to the intelligent design conclusion, and it's doing so without any basis at all. It is an argument from analogy. It is an argument from ignorance. Begging the question. It is, it is, Everything that could be wrong with it is. And when I asked before about how you bridge this gap between something looks designed and therefore it is most likely designed, your answer is Michael Behe's definition of irreducible complexity. Oh, well, that and wasn't my answer to that question. I'll no, that no, Gary, now, Gary, like. Gary, that was your answer. Yours was just a lot longer. You bridge but the gap between it looks designed and it most probably is designed by appealing to Behe's definition of irreducible complexity. That's part of it, but that's not the whole, that's not... All What's the rest do. of it? The rest of it is, first of all, determine how, how probable it is that it could have formed by, uh, if you don't want to use the word random, an unguided process. And how do you do that? A high degree yeah. of specification how it. do you assess the probability? What's your denominator? What? Okay, I'm, I'm not a mathematician to it, but I mean... Obviously. But, well, I mean, yeah, I'm a, I'm a college student. I don't have a PhD in mathematics. No, but you understand probabilities, right? I, I said that's the way I, you would go about doing it. I right, and if you, have no other, if you have no other examples, if you have nothing to compare it to, if you have no way of, de of determining the denominator, you can't come up with a probability. Yeah, because this just gets you back to my question again, Gary. It's like if you... If you want to assert that a thing is designed, if you want to assert that there, is, that there is a higher probability that a thing is designed than otherwise, then you have to know certain things. You have to know 
what would this thing be like were it not designed? You have to have a definition of non-design to, to use as a frame of reference to set against your definition of design. And if you want to say there's a greater probability of one over the other, you have to, you have to know how to work out that probability. And if okay? you're assessing... I mean, when they say here that you, what the probability is of winning the Powerball every week, I mean, that's an actual... They work that math out based on real data. You know, in terms of how many tickets are bought by people, what the what the jackpot is, you know, how wh how many states the sales are in, et cetera, et cetera. How many millions of people are out there spending their dollars on on Powerball every week? They actually, d and and then what the 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 likelihood of of the numbers coming up in the little spinning machine, right? I mean, that's that's actual data. They don't just come up with one in thirty-seven million jillion off the top of their heads. They work that out. So if you want to work out the greater probability of a designed life form to, with a non-designed life form, you have to know what both of those things look like, and you have to have your data points to be able to make that probability. You can't just say, well, it looks that way, so it just seems more likely. And that and, really and has been, of that, and that really has been all you've been saying this entire conversation. Well, it looks more likely. There's this. one more thing that he said, which is, is something that creationists have said a lot of, in addition to the, it looks this way, therefore it most likely is this way, is this issue of probability. And that is an argument that, well, evolution just seems so unlikely. Well, why is that? Well, that's a valid claim. I mean, I know people on both sides of the, uh, of the debate who have supposedly calculated the, uh, the mathematical improb uh, improbabilities for it. I mean, I know for a fact that this issue was discussed in the Dover trial and on the intelligent design side of it. I know Dr. William Densky has gone and written by extensive algorithms on the subject. Yeah, and I, know, and I know why he's wrong. He makes the same mistake that a lot of creationists make, and that is that they assume that this thing must have occurred once, and you're doing one trial instead of a pool of resources with continual attempts. And that, this is all about abiogenesis anyway, and now we're way off, and we've had you on for like 30 minutes or so. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to another caller. All right, we're not. My call, yeah, we appreciate sure. the argument. I appreciate um, it. We're we're not going to agree, and primarily we're not going to agree because you accept that Behe's definition of irreducible complexity is valid and useful, and I think it's a steaming pile yeah, of crap. So, so we're, we're, we're just we're just not on the same page with premises. On this one, and I mean, again, thank yeah, you for your time. Un to unfortunately, to that whole agree to disagree and everybody has an opinion is useless because there is such a thing as truth, and there are such things as right answers, and I'm going to believe that we have the best right answer when it's actually supported by the evidence and not supported by analogy, induction, looks designed, therefore is most likely designed. The time to believe that there's a designer is when it's actually been demonstrated to be most likely true, not a second before. Well, I'm, I'm going to believe, care. That, care. I'm believe that the methods that Dr. Behe and Dr. Dembski have used, uh, and as well as the other design theorists to identify design in nature, as I've said to you before, irreducible complexity and specified complexity, I'm gonna, I, I think that those are valid ways to do it. I mean, and, and well, good for you, but you're incorrect. Time. So it's cool. And there's plenty of people that, that believe if they pray, they'll get better. But, yeah. <laughs> The content of this video is produced by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. If you enjoyed this content and are willing and able to provide a donation, please visit the website below.